But yeah, it's going to take a long time. It would take a very long time. And you're not going to get these super tendons by doing heavy isos for two yeah, months. Yeah. It's like the person who has the super tendons, if you were cut from the same cloth, they would have the super tendon because they've been playing basketball like daily for the last 20 years. And you just picked it up yesterday. Like you've already lost. That was Jake Tira. And you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. <laughs> Today's podcast is sponsored by Team Builder. Team Builder is an online software for coaches and trainers, and I've continued to hear great things about the Team Builder platform. If you're looking for either an in house training portal for your training groups or an online training hub, be sure to check out the Team Builder training software. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Great to have you here. I'm excited to have back on the show guest Jake Atira. Jake is a performance coach, tendon expert. He specializes in hypertrophy for athletes, vertical jump training, and then all things patellar tendon on the level of rehab, strength, and performance. Jake was a collegiate strength coach for seven years. He has further experience in the private sector at Velocity Training Center, and it's always been great to have Jake as a guest on the show. For today's episode, Jake will cover many aspects and variables within tendon health and performance. We'll be talking about the elements of tendon tissue itself, so the fascicles versus the interfascicular matrix, and what that means on the terms of strength training and the tendon versus more dynamic exercise, such as plyometrics and the tendon. We'll talk about variable aspects of training, so training in a straight line, the same thing over and over again, versus things like uh, Polish jump boxes or running on rocks and things where there's all sorts of vari uh, variability at play, and how that impacts the fullness of connective tissue training. Uh, we'll be talking about this, long-term developmental concepts, uh, training on hard or soft surfaces, and much more. Jake is really a go-to for all things tendon, strength, health, and performance, and it was awesome having him back on the show. Let's get to episode 371. The, uh, the bone thing's interesting, Matt, because a lot of the tendon stuff you get from horses, and they, they're talking about bone training for horses. And uh, to, to my recollection, it was like running on very hard surfaces so they get the impacts you know oh heck yeah. and that was like their bone training like they didn't look at they didn't look at racing or running as on a on the pasture as bone training they were like we do so it's like they had the muscle training they have the bone training and then it was like tendon almost gets developed just by proxy of doing muscle and bone training you know that's awesome um, uh, yeah <laughs> yeah that that's interesting man because i <laughs> It's funny, I had heard, so Don Beebe, I, I've mentioned him on the show a couple times in the sense of, um, so like, there's like the Lila Exogen weights, and before Lila came out, there was a more rough version of it called the Power Trim, and I thought Don Beebe invented it, but he, I guess he was just like a spokesperson for it, because Don Beebe was a NFL player around like 4-2-2 in the 40, he had the 40 record at some point way back in the day, played for the Green Bay Packers. And I was reading just a little bit about him because, you know, as well as I do back in the 90s, like stuff was way more intuitive, like 20, 30, 40 years ago before I think you could just go out and, and formally see anything about training. A lot more, I think, back then was based off, hey, this guy tried this crazy thing off feel. He didn't read anything on the Internet. He just did what felt interesting. And Don Beebe had talked about jumping barefoot on the concrete. He's like, hey, if you want to get Springer, go jump barefoot on the concrete or something. And so that got me on this kick of and i was thinking about this i remember trying this in berkeley just kind of i was in in my minimal shoes just playing soccer in the apartment parking lot with my kids or something and i was just kind of jumping and doing some pop-ups so barefoot on, or barefoot shoes on concrete and i just remember the responsiveness of how i popped off the ground kind of felt like when i was young like 18 playing basketball didn't even need to warm up and go dunk and stuff like that and so it just got me on starting to do like skips and and even a little bit of running barefoot on the concrete near my house just to kind of you know play around with that i think there's gonna be a different threshold for different people and what they can tolerate for sure but it's it's been really interesting it's been super interesting so i i would never heard that before it makes sense with the horses though and all that yeah man it makes me think about if you're if you would be adapting tendon so like they say if you run on a soft surface so you do with sand it's like more muscular you know it's more muscular, less tendon, because you're going to be probably stretching your muscle more. But I, it makes me think that, can you adapt the muscle end of the tendon and the bone end of the tendon? Because it's like, we, we often think of when you're trying to load a tendon, you get it from the muscle pulling on it. But I'm like, also the bone position. Like, what if you just jar yourself? What if you just get jarred by like landing on a hard surface and your muscle can't really 
isn't the first line of what's going on of responding, but it's like the bone is taking the impact. And is that going to cause a difference in the mm. tendon? We, we all, you know what I'm saying? We yeah. always think of like muscle pulling on tendon, which then pulls on bone. But what if your bone just gets jarred or your bone is the one pulling on the tendon and then the muscle responds later? Or is that the case where you rupture, where you get a rupture? I, I would think <laughs> that's probably not. Yeah, I would imagine that's probably not the ideal situation in the sense of, you know, you had posted this, the or if it's just the bone hitting, I would think, well, then, but then again, like I, I, we had, before we pushed record, I was talking about like the Shaolin monks who like they hit the, the hard bag or even, I don't know, wood or something like hundreds or thousands of times to condition the bones and then obviously the connective tissue and things like that. But I think it's a little different because that like punching doesn't work the same way that the Achilles works in landing or, or the, you know, a heel hitting just because it's almost like, the fingers in a punch will will distribute the for they kind of take on the Achilles roughly like in the way that each of the, the almost the bending of the fingers and the kind of the crinkling of the fist that is your rapid force absorber versus yeah it, it, I could get back to what I was saying you had posted this it was something like a tendon at rest and it had the it was almost like it was just folded in half or something it was like the collagen was just chill and folded in half yeah, yeah and then it tenses up and I guess if you think about that or you put yourself in a picture of the micro. And it's like, it's just chill and folded. And then all of a sudden, wham, you know, and it just goes to like instantly stretched. I wonder, I mean, although I don't know, I mean, there is, you know, it all happens so fast, right? But versus something where there's maybe more tensegrity coming up in the foot initially, like the foot has a chance to tighten up a little bit and then that goes up to the leg tendons. And I, I, the only thing I was just thinking about with that was, there was that story, it was always floating around almost like an urban legend of this dude back in the forum days of the 2000s, this dude who had heel spurs and so bone spurs in his heels. And so we always had yeah. to walk around kind of on the balls of his feet and he had massive calves and had a huge like like two foot vertical and could get up off the ground really quickly. Like he apparently could put his elbows on the rim and stuff. And so it's almost like, you know, with no heel hitting was able to achieve these adaptations. And so what so he had bones like he had pain with the bone spurs or it was just like a thing they recognized pain so it was like if he heel hit hard at all from my understanding it would hurt so he adapted to the point where he just got into the forefoot almost instantly and this was in he talked about himself being like a volleyball like volleyball was his thing so versus you know i know a lot of times in plyos and stuff it's like well use the whole foot and i'm like well yeah if you bound you you kind of have to roll through you can't just bound and land on your toe you need time to distribute the forces but in the context of at least just a two-leg jump or a standing jump he was so loaded off the ball of the foot and all the tissues had adapted into that he was able to do that so i i actually remember i heard that when i was in my 20s uh when i was coaching at wilmington college and i took this is i mean this is a good way to get yourself a lawsuit if this was an actual invention but I took uh, like thumbtacks and, and I cut the, the sharp part, the metal part off. Like, so I just shaved the metal part off and then I actually flipped it. So the wide part was at the bottom of the heel and then the, the narrow part was like at the top. So, so the narrow part where you push with your thumb, where you usually would push the thumbtack down. Now that plastic piece was sticking up in your heel and it just kind of hurt. And so yeah. I, I was like walking around. I put those in the heels of my shoes. I was walking around with it. I had a couple high jumpers I was working with and I had them wear it throughout the day. <laughs> and honestly, we all said this is helping. But then some bones started to hurt in my foot after like a month of doing that. Because I, I had some entrepreneurial visions of that kind of thing. But then I started to, I was feeling it in one of the, the metatarsals of my foot. And I was like, I don't know if this is a great idea. But I will say I was feeling springier in general, um, doing that tactic. So yeah, it was, it was an interesting time yeah. in my life. I haven't gone back to it, but interesting. When, uh, so when you get a heel spur, is that, is that just like a bony outgrowth? Does that happen on, on the tendon or what is it? You I think know? it's like the bottom of the calcaneus is just sharper. The, the heel oh, bone, I think okay. it's just sharper than it should be. Like my brother had it growing up and he had to get like, like heel, like the little rubbery, heel cup things like okay the, yeah in the shoes. yeah because i was thinking i was thinking when you look at the you look at the the bone end of the tendon it kind of has this it has this gradual turn from like type one collagen into um bone mm -hmm. but it's like a i think there's like four phases of it um but uh you look at there's a i think it's chickens chickens their tendons like we have the achilles tendon which goes from the collagen into the bone but they'll 
theirs turn into bone like their tendons mineralize and turn into bone interesting um i i don't know the reason and like turkeys do that too but i was i i I don't know the reason uh but now and this might be completely misguided but this talk is just i'm kind of wondering like are we gonna be are we gonna focus on the bone end of the tendon training and maybe try to mineralize it more or something like that you know what i'm saying because a lot of the tendon issues are like the I, I'm probably at the antesis. Is that the right word or antesis? How you say it? Antesis, um, I think. Antesis, yeah, whatever it is. I don't, I, I don't know why I say it the way I say it. I must have heard it that way. But um, that uh, the the issues happen there. That's where the issues happen. Is like the bone end yeah. of the tendon. Yeah, so, yeah, where it inserts, going, right? Like, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. So, so going back to it's it's not going to happen at the muscle tendon junction. You're not going to get a tendon issue there. You're probably going to get a, a, a your muscle is going to rupture like higher up or get a tear. But you always get the issues at the bone end. Um. So yeah, it makes me wonder that horse, that horse training and that horse book, that little bit I, I remember of them being on like hard surfaces and, and kind of getting those hard impacts was training the bone. And um, I wonder if we would, if we could know anything about adapting that end of the tendon by having the hard hmm. impacts. And it's probably like the, the dose, the poison thing, you know, like you would need a little bit. Yeah. And if you did too much, then you're going to maybe cause a tendinopathy. But if you did the right amount. Now your bone end of the tendon is like so resilient from developing a tendinopathy. It's an interesting thought. I could be I could be completely misguided. And then a lot of the issues, tendon issues, come from like the mid portion of the Achilles too, which is like not uh, connecting to the bone. So that's like if you were mid portion, then it would just be like that throws would throw a wrench in the whole thing. <laughs> Outside of all the other tendons are like right in the bone when they get a tendon issue. Yeah, I'll um I'll have to keep running barefoot on the concrete, and I'll tell you, I'll report back to you. I, yeah, it is interesting. I know for me, um, in my history with um, Achilles stuff, it's, it's always been right on that insertion. And yeah, it's, it's, um, oh, it's, it's interesting even with uh, some of the footwear. So I, I modify, uh, Darian Bard uh, basically learned through him how to modify footwear. And as I've modified shoes to be more like reactive, like con- not, they're, it's not like running on concrete, but you get response faster off of the ground, like it's a quicker turnover. And I actually find that that changes, that makes the, the, the source of Achilles pain actually even more, um, it actually, it makes it better, but it can make it even more on the bone. Whereas if I have the softer shoe, it's more in the belly of the tendon, if that makes sense. I don't oh, really? Know why that yeah. is, yeah. Um, yeah. But I was going to say, you, you had said this, I, I just thought this was interesting. Um, and I don't know if there's an answer for this, but it was uh, like Charlie Francis had said, like running on grass, like as opposed to with the horses, right? um running on grass he, i think his theory was like it makes the muscle work faster because you don't get the tendon you don't get like all everything the quick response out of the tendon running on grass that you would running on a hard surface so the muscle has to do a faster stretching and shortening or something like that and i could see that but then i'm like and i do think about like yeah jamaican sprinters they run on the grass in the off season probably do more volume, get more momentum in training without worrying about any soft tissue stuff, right? Or any issues along the way. But then I also think, I mean, just for me, just in my short time doing a little, following the Don Beebe model (laughs) and doing a little bit of barefoot stuff on the concrete, I'm like, I like this. Like, honestly, like even, even um, like I watch kids play, I I watch my children play and I, and I just think about when I was a kid and my kids run around barefoot all over the place. And there's just something about feeling, you know, you're running barefoot on grass, but then you're running barefoot on the sidewalk and you're getting both of the adaptations basically at the same time. So I'm like, you know, do you have to do only one or the other at any given time? I don't know, but um, yeah, just things, things that go through my mind with all this, but I, I, the horse example, that's so cool. I just think there's so much we can learn by studying like, yeah, animals or, or horse training even because they don't play by the same kind of general rules as we do. And like you said, the structures are different too, which I, I had no idea with the chickens or turkeys or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. But the, they'll use the horse, the horse, um, whatever that tendon's called, the SDFT, I forget what it stands for. They'll use that for the Achilles. Cause it's like very similar though, compared to the human Achilles. And, um, it, it is, there's a lot of parallels with the horses. Um, probably one of them, which is not a parallel is like when they, when they do get a rupture, they get a tendon, they're on the verge of getting a tendon pain. Um, they do not want to let them out into the pasture, hmm. um, because they'll go and destroy it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's like, they have to, yeah, they have to keep them in, in a stall. And it's like, Jeez. I feel like our, in our world, we, inc- when someone's in pain, we encourage movement and play. Um, but if you give an animal and it's like, they're, they're, they're injured or they're, 
there and probably the warm up effect of a tendon it warms up feels better uh you can get into a lot of trouble but it's like it's they'll actually uh, from my i think i've read like three or four horse tendon books they're all they're all fascinating they're all really good reads um and apparently the horse world tom ivers was a guy who wrote a lot of the books he uh was just disgusted at the way people treated their horses <laughs> and they would just run into tendon issues ruptures all the time but um yeah the rehab man the rehab is like months long and it's very very specific and regimented and mm -hmm. it's like don't do anything go for a 10 minute walk for the first like 30 days um and then you can build up to a little bit longer walk and um but it's it's um they have to do that because the horse if you let the horse free it'll just go and blow their tendon so um i guess that doesn't necessarily happen with humans we 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 just go and immobilize and do nothing which is like has its own set of negatives. <laughs> yeah. Do you yeah. think that, I mean, with animals and humans though, it is interesting. Cause like, like my, my neighbor's dog is, um, it's like a golden retriever, but I think it's got some like bulldog mixed in there. But this dog is like a hundred pounds roly poly, but has just insane energy. So it's always wrestling the other dog and it blew its ace dog ACL. It's not in dogs. It's not the ACL, but it blew out its dog ACL way at like a year and a half, which is super young for dogs. But you just watch that it, and then it it got surgery and like its rehab process is kind of like just let it play and it kind of self-regulates. But then if the other dog's there and it wants to play, it like forgets it's hurt and just starts. And I think that there's that with animals and humans, maybe we have, you know, with whatever the outer layer of the brain that we have um, developed, it's just, you know, we have a lot more regulation maybe for better or for worse. But I think that you know, when we maybe have the gift of being able to be more mindful, like this is too much. I can tolerate this level. If I go above this level, it's going to be a problem tomorrow where animals don't have that. It's almost more instinct or not instinct, all or nothing and, and those kind of things. Um, so, which is interesting, but I mean, the dog did, my neighbor's dog is better now. Like, and they weren't, the, it's not like he's going to the dog physical therapist saying, do three sets of 10. It's like, Hey, go yeah, walk yeah. him, go walk him. <laughs> You know, he'll get better. Just try not to let him do too much. He did have to sit in his cage for, I think, a certain amount of time periodically and stuff like that, but, or, or just not be able to run at all. But it was interesting watching animals rehab versus the human process, you know, and, and, you yeah. know, the dog. <laughs> so it's interesting. Yeah. Cause you're, you're not going to do like they had a, one of those, I know Keith Barr has those case studies of like having a tendon hole. And then his method of regeneration is the, the isometrics to get the stress relaxation. And then over the months, they they see the hole fill in. Interesting. Um, but it's still that question. It's like a normal tendon is mostly type one collagen, linear type one collagen. Um, and then when you injure it, it probably fills with fluid. And then it's going to have a rehab process of filling with type three collagen, which is like thinner and less strong and more like a scar. Um, so I'm I'm wondering if you get that fill in, is is it is it just type three? Or is it actually type one, like a normal tendon? But anyways, he has like two case studies where it's like the way to heal a tendon hole is the heavy isometrics. Hmm. Um, and then you have Peter Malieris, one of the researchers who is like, he'll do scans, ultrasound scans on people with ten with different islands of holes within their tendons. And then he'll see them like months or years later and those holes have resolved. And it's like they didn't actually do some some specific loading program. They just resolved. And it's the same. They had a horse, they had a horse and one of those horse books. The horse had like a huge hole in there what what is what is like the human version of the achilles tendon for them mm -hmm. and it was i think five months later completely filled in and that horse didn't do isometrics that horse just did like let's not let's not um do too much do stuff. do the do the walking into the jogging into yeah. the the canter and then into the running and it's like they scan it again i think it was mri they scan it again and it's like the holes completely filled in hmm. um seth o'neill had the same seth o'neill is one of the achilles tendon researchers he had another case study like that too uh, which like massive hole in this guy's Achilles. And then they would scan it um, month after month and it completely filled in. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like, I think it just takes a long time and we don't have patience. Um, mm -hmm. But those things can fill in. And that whole idea that like Jill Cook put out that treat the, the donut, not the hole. Like, don't worry about the degeneration. It's mechanically silent. It's never going to come back on board. There's been a lot of evidence against that, mm -hmm. that those things can actually heal themselves. It's just that, you, I, I do like what she says because you, you don't want someone to get obsessed with their imaging. You know, if someone's like, I have a hole in my tendon, that's most people are going to be fearful of going back and playing sport because mm. they have a hole in their tendon. So it's like getting them not to worry and realize that your body's going to lay down more collagen. But uh, yeah, dude, the the animals, the animal situations where they have the holes and they fill in without the the weight room stuff, it's like, 
hey, it's fascinating. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it, it could just be a, a matter of patience. Uh, that could like that could be all it is like smart loading, because if you do absolutely nothing, your collagen synthesis goes down the drain and mm -hmm. I guess basically goes to zero if you immobilize a joint. Um, maybe not to zero, but it goes very far down and you need collagen synthesis. You need to be synthesizing collagen in your tendon to rebuild it. So you do need movement, movement to load the tendon. But it's like, do you need the isometrics and the heavy strength? Uh, I'm still going to do them. I'm still going to suggest yeah. them for people in tendon pain, but it's like in the future, it'd be like, okay, you got a hole in your tendon. Let's do just do common sense for the next five months. Don't aggravate the thing and let's let it fill in. That, that might be something in the future, um, which is like completely against the old train of thought, which is that tendon is inert and tendon doesn't change. It's like, that is so wrong. Yeah. Uh, things are, things are changing. They just take a while. Yeah. Just by, by virtue of being human, we have plasticity to pretty much everything and it's um yeah it's dude it's sorry to go oh, further yeah, go it's ahead. like yeah. they say so i read recently like bone when a bone breaks and a bone heals it'll it'll heal normally but like if you if you injure a tendon or like maybe any other tissue you scar you'll see you'll get a scar and um it, so weird they'll say it in like um babies or maybe when they're still in the womb if they get injured they'll they'll heal without a scar so that if you injure their tendon while they're still developing, I don't know if it's when they're in the womb and they haven't been born yet, if they injure their tendon, their body will heal it without laying down a scar. So it'll just mm. be normal, healthy tissue. But for some reason, when you get older and you injure your, your tendon, it's going to heal as a scar. Mm. You're going to have a scar and it's never going it, to, I mean, it, it's never going to be the same exact structure it was back then versus the bone. I guess a bone heals normally and a bone is just fine like mm. the way it was before. But uh, a tendon that, 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 that it's not the case. So once you injure it, it's like it, it probably will not be the same. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I, I it makes me interested or curious in a little bit more of the nature of a, a bone versus tendon and, and training. Uh, I do want to ask you actually maybe a, a thought that could be applied for uh, either athletes who are rehabbing or healthy and just injury prevention type perspectives. But uh, so you mentioned Keith Barr. Uh, this was one of my questions. Is he had talked? You know the the podcast that he had done with me years ago uh it's such a classic episode but he had talked about slower heavier motions for more health uh you have fast motions for speed and performance and those two are kind of uh you know complementary <laughs> yeah you could you you do some slow stuff you do some fast stuff um but you had mentioned uh you had just talked about how like animals you, I, I guess I, I'll just call it the walk it off, <laughs> the, the, the walk it off principle or just, just do what nature intended, do what you can, do what you can every day and get a little better every day. Um, you, you said you still recommend heavy isometrics, but my question for you is fundamentally, um, maybe it's this it, it, with the animal example, what difference is it or is there a difference between uh, like just doing heavy either isos or even just like heavy loading I don't even like a heavy like slow squat or something? And then like a high rep plyo or just, I mean, you could even say you know, run, running, walking, that's all plyometric in a sense, uh, like high rep, repetitive, elastic motions. Is there a difference in what's happening in the tendon between them? I mean, you mentioned the hole gets filled in either way or can get filled in either way. Uh, yeah. But from a mechanical perspective, and we're talking about tendon health, resiliency and things like that, is there any hard line difference between the two? Yeah. So for heavy, heavy strength versus um, like a plyometric. So... I guess, yeah, take, probably take the Achilles. We take the Achilles and let's say, because an isometric is the far end of that mm -hmm. uh, up and down rep would be like you getting the muscles moving through a range of motion. You know, the muscle is going to be contracting, relaxing through a range of motion. But if you did an ISO, so say you just did like a, a, a calf raise ISO for your um, Achilles tendon and you did just mid range, heavy as possible, mm -hmm. uh, you, your muscle is going to, your muscle will be holding that position. And then as your muscle tires, it gets shorter and shorter. So the tendon will be getting longer and longer to maintain the joint mm -hmm. position. And the thing uh, with tendons, I made a Twitter post saying it, it, it went off really well before they counted the views you got. So I can't really see how many I got, but it was tendon is dumb. Uh, so I started it. Tendon is stupid. Like it doesn't actually do anything on its own. It only responds to what's happening at the muscle or at the bone. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to get adaptation through your tendon, you have to activate your muscle as hard as possible or you have to do something with your your joint position um with through the bone you know like um so anyways the way through like the lifting is to get adaptation through your tendon because all your tendon knows is that crimp you talk about it it bent it's bending when it's crimped and then it mm -hmm. goes it goes linear and it pulls so that's all it really knows is bending and then straight bending and then straight 
So you want to get, if you want adaptation through your tendon, you want to get rid of the crimp, which you do by pulling on it with the muscle. And then you want to get to, to, to further limits of the linear pull, like they call it strain mm-hmm. elongation. You want to get to a high level of elongation with your tendon, which is kind of hard to do because if you think of it's in series with muscle and the muscle is super stretchy, your muscle is just going to take up the, the, the elongation. You know, if you just did like a, a say, for example, you did a deep static stretch, mm-hmm. you probably get a, a stretch through your muscle and you don't get much through your tendon. Got it. Um, yeah. It's, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, I would think that if you did a heavy lifting exercise, uh, you're going to get a lot, you're probably going to get more muscular involvement than you would get tendon involvement because you're getting the muscles to work through a full range of motion. Mm-hmm. If you just did a heavy ISO as heavy as possible, your muscle would be stuck and it would be shortening a little bit. And then you would get the adaptation through the tendon. So I, the way I look at this is you have, uh, you're going to be hitting, you're going to be the call when you do the lifting, the collagen is crimped and then it goes straight. So you're pulling on the, the collagen, you're getting it to reorient, to get stronger. You're probably breaking some cross links mm-hmm. with the collagen, whatever you're making that collagen stronger, but you have collagen within the fascicles of the tendon. And then outside of those fascicles, there's the, the gel, the interfascicular matrix gel. It's like this, this matrix that allows for the collagen fascicles to slide and rotate with one another. And when you do heavy lifting, I don't think you're doing anything to that gel. You're mm-hmm. not getting any adaptation. With it. But if you went and you did the hopping exercise for the Achilles, like you said, the, the jogging or something, that's where the gel component would be making the collagen fascicles slide and rotate around mm-hmm. one another, um, which would kind of protect them from excess strain, excess, excess uh, linear pull. Um, so I, that's the kind of the way I look at it where I'm like, those two components of tendon, you have the collagen fascicles, which everyone knows, everyone's talks about, they just go crimp to linear and they pull mm. in a linear fashion. But then you have this gel, which is like, it, it has linear stress, but it also has compressive stress and yeah. it has shear stress. It has all these things going on um, to, to my, the way I look at it, to protect the collagen fascicles from excess linear pull. Because mm. if, you ex- if you linear pull them too far, they rupture. And then the whole tendon ruptures if you rupture enough of your fascicles. Yeah. Um, so your body wants to protect that. So it has this gel and this gel allows for the sliding and rotating. And then you can beat up the gel. That's usually what you see with like a reactive tendinopathy. That's kind of the theory is when you initially get a tendon pain, you, you kind of blown up the gel component. So the gel has been overloaded because it's had to go through all this linear compressive shear stress to protect your collagen. You've blown up your, your gel, your tendon can get like red and hot. It's really sensitive. And if you just rest for a little bit, like a few days or maybe a week or maybe two, depending how bad the gel um, comes back because it's, it's loaded with cells. It has like 10 times the cells mm. of the collagen. So the recovery capacity of the gel is, is, is quick. But if you break down the collagen and the fascicles, that recovery capacity is, is super slow. Mm. Um, so that's, uh, I don't know if that, does that really answer your question of like yeah. what's going on with the heavy strength versus the, the plyometric is I think you get the gel component with the plyometric yeah, yeah. and with the heavy strength, you're really just, you're really just hitting the collagen and you're laying off the gel. Which could be if you have a blown up um, react. So if you have a reactive tendinopathy and your tendon is blown up and painful, you don't want to be be stressing your IFM. So you're not going to want to go do jumping, but you usually be fine to do heavy lifting yeah. because heavy lifting is just pulling <clears throat> on the collagen and your gel is kind of it, getting a getting a chance to take a break. So yeah, those two components of tendon um, for me, Hazel Screen is a, the big researcher. She put out all this work on the intrafascicular matrix. A lot of it in horses. A lot of the initial stuff yeah. in horses. Um, but it's like, why don't more people talk about this? This is fascinating. And it, and it just makes complete sense when you look at the course of people's tendon pains and, and probably what's going on structurally. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I was like, well, from my mind, what you're talking about sounds like, yeah, heavy lifting, more of the collagen plyometric type stuff, more the inter, uh, IFM or the inner, what yeah. did you call it again? Sorry. My, it's my, the inter, so it's the interfascicular matrix because it's matrix, outside yeah. of the fascicles. So yeah, <clears throat> yeah, it's outside of the fascicles. So there's really, it's like the collagen, everyone call it tendon is collagen so like the the fascicles are packed with collagen it's basically like all collagen but then outside of the fascicles there's the gel and there's barely any collagen in the gel it's like um elastic that's where you have the elastic fibers so you have Mm -hmm. elastin there's more elastin in the gel uh there's more lubricin it's just all these components that would make it make your tendon elastic and kind of lubricate the um because lubricin lubricate yeah so um it's 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 interesting to look at because when you look at the outside of a tendon, all a tendon does is pull. It, it just pulls linear. That's all it does. The Achilles, mm-hmm. I guess you get a little bit of twisting, but it, it pulls linear. The patellar tendon it pulls linear, but that doesn't necessarily mean what's going on internally. Yes. So I think I think yeah I think internally 
is you have that th- those differences happening. And then you look at age. Um, when you start to look at age, people as they get older, their IFM gel uh, hmm. kind of goes away. It kind of like uh, I love Matt Watson said it dries up. I don't. That's a it was a, <laughs> we become, a we become interesting prunes, way to look at prunes over time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, but it's the one of the ideas is if if you haven't if you haven't specifically injured your collagen, your collagen's probably staying fine because the half life of collagen is like two hundred years. Oh. So it's 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 going to last. Yeah, it. I mean, it does break down and build up every day, but it's it's a very um, static long term tissue versus the IFM gel. The half life of that I forget, but I think it's only like seven years or so. So it's this idea that it is it is renewing all the time. It, it's just that when you get older. Um, the I think the water component, the fluid component, <laughs> yeah. kind of decreases, and your tendon actually. So the relative portion of your tendon, I think, would be more collagen. So it yeah. would be like you maintain the collagen. The, the strength of your tendon is there. It's just that this elasticity and this this lubrication component of internally what's happening is not there anymore. And then you have the question: How do you how do you maintain that? And I'm just like, if you if you don't use it, you lose it. I think that's what happens because as you get older, you stop doing elastic things, and I think that's probably what. Uh, takes away your elasticity in your tendon. I wanted to take a quick break from the show and share about the difference that performance herbalism can make for you. Several years back, I had strongman, mental training expert, and herbalist Logan Christopher on the show, and the show was about uh, mental training originally. And after the episode, I realized that Logan had an herbalism company. I had no idea really much about herbalism, uh, but I ended up ordering the Phoenix formula. Uh, I ended up getting great results, increased energy. I far decreased my need for caffeine. And a couple of weeks after taking the Phoenix formula, I actually noticed that my weight room numbers were going up, which I really hadn't expected when I first used the product. And shortly thereafter, I got into Shiliajit resin, which is also in the Phoenix formula and is popular with strength coaches. Uh, pine pollen tincture, some of the mushroom tinctures that they have. And I really believe in what Logan and Lost Empire Herbs are doing in creating and facilitating a natural approach uh, to performance supplementation. If you want to check out the herbs that I use personally at Lost Empire, you can head to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly. And there you can also grab 15% off your order. If you use the code justfly at checkout as well, that'll also get you that 15% off. They have a 365-day money-back guarantee, and I'm really happy that they're sponsors of the show. So, hope you get a chance to check them out. Uh, let's get back to the episode. Yeah, it's interesting to think about, yeah, why we, even as you were talking, like, perform, and, and a lot of this is very similar to what Bill Hartman was talking about when he was on the podcast recently, and he was talking about how we don't have as much hydration as we get older, we get less elastic in that sense, and so it kind of would make you think, well, maybe the um, interfascicular matrix is kind of the the fountain of youth in that perspective. And you look at, um, like, you know, Kim Collins, I think he's probably retired now, but the the sprinter from, I don't know, it wasn't Trinidad and Tobago, somewhere in the Caribbean, St. Kitts and Nevis, that's right. Uh, he was 40 years old and ran, I think, 10.01 or, I, I, he might have even ran a windy 9.99 at 40. So, he was like this just super longevity type person and even back in the day when he was in his 30s, people would talk about him as like being like a stick, like clearly didn't lift weights or very likely wasn't a big weightlifter at all. And just kind of uh, it it makes you think about the longevity of um, longevity just based off of hydration and the the nature of your connective tissue uh, versus, you know, and there's a million things too. But like, I mean, like Dr. Squat, Fred Hatfield squatted a thousand pounds at age 40. Like that, so that the 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 collagen and the fast twitch, whatever he was able to preserve, the muscular force game was still strong. So it's interesting to think about what is the source of degradation of performance over time. Uh, yes, fast twitch muscles do start to nosedive when you get in your forties, fifties, or whatever. But you know how much of this is due to collagen as well, and then or the matrix, and then how do we preserve that as well as possible? Uh, yeah, there was uh, one of these. Yeah, so one of these. Uh, so I. Uh, the the all these tendon books I, I flew through some of them were miserable to go through but one of them was was fascinating it was um just just written very artfully and uh so enjoyable it was one of the last ones i read and uh but he was talking about this the collagen and the elastin and it was like if you look at a connected i think it was all connective tissues because you look at if you look at the the lungs and the arteries and everything it's like you have collagen and elastin in everything um you could the elastin is there for the extent for the uh um, flexibility, you know, elastin is very flexible. It can, it can extend very far and then return to its normal shape, but it's not very strong. So if you just had elastin in your tissue, mm. it would probably break. 
your tissues would probably just rupture. So you need collagen because collagen is strong. It basically is like a scaffolding. So you you need scaffolding in all of your all of your tissues. Like your arteries need collagen. Yeah, it can't just be elastin. But if you have too much collagen, now they're stiff, and that's probably not a good thing. Uh, but if you look at go down the tendon, it's like basically all collagen, and there's barely they say like two percent elastin. But it would just make you look at it and it would be like, okay, do we want the the ten? What do we want out of the tendon? We want it to definitely be strong and stiff, and then a little bit elastic. But we don't want it to be like super elastic and then not that strong yeah. because of the forces it has to deal with. Um, so it's like it's it's built in it's built in the perfect way. So for us to say, let's try to we need to change this thing to make it uh, more elastic or more stiff is like, uh, unless you're injured, of course you're injured, you got to intervene. Yeah. But it's like that thing is built in the perfect way. Do you think nature didn't figure this thing out? Um, and then you look at, but then you start to look at elastin. So this collagen book was, uh, talking about the half-life of collagen. It's like 200 years, but then they were saying the half-life of elastin, I, and I could be wrong, but I think it was 70 years. Um, and then they were saying that how, do you, do you produce more elastin over your life? And from what I remember, they're saying no. So like collagen, you build all that you build and break down all the time, but they were mm -hmm. saying that elastin is one of those things that's kind of just built and then it's there and it's like, are you not going to be building more? And then if, if the half life is 70 years only before like half of the material is, is de de degraded, that the, that's the right term, de degraded. <laughs> yes. Degraded. We'll, have to, we'll list the terms here. Degraded. Yeah, I whatever. the other one um, we were talking about was. <laughs> yeah. But then I'm like, okay, if it's 70 years, then it's like, of course you're going to have more, less elasticity as you get older. Cause it's like that, that unit that is giving you the elasticity is degrading. So it's like, how do you, get away from that i don't know is there any way and um, i but i kind of look at it now luckily that it's like i mean i'm 32 the the drive i have uh now to go and want to dunk out of like the insecurity of i want to jump high or something it's like it just goes away as you get older and you just care about other things so it's like i don't really i probably did have fear when i was like 30 or 27 of like oh i don't want to lose my my bounce and my elasticity and whatever and that's like you get older it's like man who cares about that that's for kids you know that's for children to, to to be insecure about. It's still fun for me, but I don't have that same drive and insecurity about it. So it's like the, the body probably, if you lose elasticity, it's just par for the course. It's just meant to happen. And and luckily, by the time you're like 40, 50, you don't have that same drive as the 18-year-old kid. Um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. At least uh, in the athletic endeavors, yeah. I, I, I definitely get that. I know for me, I've kind of gone through some waves. I mean, I'll be 40 here in uh, about less than two months now, which is crazy. But you know, in, in that process, it's kind of been fun. Um, you know, once you hit 40, you you have to realize, like, I'm not going to jump as high as I did when I was in my 20s. I'm not going to run as fast as I did. But you have to find other ways to make it meaningful or you select something else, you know, that's meaningful. And I think that's the big thing is it's it's what what and how and why is this meaningful. And so for me, a lot of the meaning has been just learning more about how my body produces movement, um, some of the finer points of training in that perspective, even stuff like, Hey, I'm going to run on concrete for a little bit and just see how that goes, you know, and just see what happens with that. And it's like, I mean, I probably did it when I was a kid too. Um, but I was thinking, you know, as you were saying or talking about, you know, the elastin and aging and it's like, all right, and the IFM and, and what's the fountain of youth with this stuff, or even just good training. If you're, you know, if you're even in your twenties or you're coaching high school kids and obviously, and understanding that they're maybe playing by a little different physiological rules than an older population. But I was thinking about longevity with that and a couple thoughts. And I had this kind of as questions, but one was like, I saw this video. I, I should find this because it's awesome. It should be in my library. I don't know why I just don't have it uh, readily, but it was like two, uh, it was uh, two Brazilian uh, men who were probably like 60 years old and they were like break dancing with kids. And they just look so, you know, for if you wanted to define being able to move with elasticity and uh, be able to have, have movement options, have meaning in your movement, uh, these guys were it. They could do, I mean, they couldn't do all the crazy power moves, but they could do a lot of cool stuff. And they were like, had huge smiles on their faces. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And so, it also, that got me in the train of thinking, okay, like variability, meaning, something that's important and still fun to you. But then, um, you know, Rafe Kelly had mentioned this when he was, I think it was his first appearance on the podcast, he had mentioned doing parkour in nature, like he was dunking a ball just as easily, if not more, than, um, and I don't think he was doing like a lot of squats or anything else outside of that, like literally just jumping from log to log, rock to rock, all sorts of nature activities, minimal shoes more likely than not. Um, and I was thinking about the 
like variability, I guess, like like variability as well. So it's like instead of just doing the same thing over and over and over again, like let's say, I'm, you know, I'm doing hurdle hops and bounding and squats and it's all the same motion and depth jumps versus something that's like, and, and this is a topic I don't want to get your opinion on this is for me, just even running in the creek, like I, my off days, I jog on rocks in the creek and minimal shoes, super high variability. And after that, like my tendons feel amazing. Like my RSI, like even just testing my RSI casually is pretty good. Like, like in light, in the wake of that, um, my right knee pain, I used to have knock on one here. That's I'm saying. I like watch me say this and then my knee hurts tomorrow. <laughs> my right knee, which had given me problems for a long time has been feeling awesome. It's always amazing for my tendons. Like a lot of times I'll wake up and my ten Achilles tendons might be stiff getting out of bed. If I do that run on the Creek, I wake up the next day and it's almost always like no pain getting out of bed. So I'm like, what exactly is going on here? And it's also not just me. I've, I've suggested that method to like a uh, master's high jumper I train. She's in her mid forties and is, she jumps over her own head still, I think. And that suggested that to her works really well with her Achilles stuff. And so, you know, I was just thinking about variability at, and like all those little subtle variable motions. You talked about the intercellular or vesicular yeah. matrix. So like there's, there's pressure, there's lateral, there's probably like, you know, say spiraling or whatever. Um, just thoughts on, on variable movements, uh, in light of like running on rocks or, or even just sport, I guess you could say in light of its impact on tendons and collagen and the IFN. Yeah. So, um, the, I I was so, I was so happy they said this in this last book I read, which it was a pain. It was, it was miserable to get through this book. (laughs) Like some of these, some of these, it was probably written in the nineties. And it's like, if they write it like a robot and they just are like rotator cuff tendinopathy, Achilles tendinopathy, and they just list off all the facts and the stats. It's like, this is so painful to read. And I just fly through it. But at the end of the book, um, I had read this at another place and I don't remember where, but they were talking about the fascicles of the tendons. So if you look at like your, and I've, I've tried to figure out how many fascicles you have in a tendon. And I, I just don't know, uh, <laughs> uh, but they did, they, they did it, uh, in the, in a rat, they did a study on rat, the rat tail tendon. Because the, the the rat tail has a t- has tendons in it, um. So one of the tendons, they said one of the, or maybe it only has one tendon. I'm not sure. But anyways, how many fascicles are in that tendon? How many individual like units of collagen are in that tendon? And they said it was like one to ten, I think. So like depending on the rat, they could have one fascicle or they could have ten fascicles. And then I was looking at the the diameters of everything. Like you can you can look at the diameter of a uh, the diameter of a tendon. And then look at the diameter of a fascicle, look at the diameter of collagen, and then just do like basic math. But the problem is the di- diameters are changing and all of the, <laughs> they, they, they give you different diameters um, all across the board. But anyways, let's just take the Achilles. And um, we, for a fact, there are many different fascicles. Let's say maybe there's like 30 fascicles or 50 fascicles, or maybe 100 fascicles, and they're all packed with collagen. So this last book I read, uh, they were saying that the fascicles work independently. So when you pull on the tendon, you don't work all 50 fascicles. You might only work 10 fascicles. Um, and that made me think of like, okay, if you did, if you did a, a movement that, that if it was a, a hurdle hop and the same thing you did, um, are you stressing like 20 fascicles and the other 30 fascicles are not getting stressed? Mm-hmm. Is, is that what's happening? You know? Um, and then I would think too, when you get injured, if you do, cause when you, in, when you injure your tendon, you could only injure a few fascicles. You could only injure one fascicle and you still have 49 that are, that are good to go and give you strength. Um, so the body might compensate around that. Mm. I mean, I just don't know. And then you got to look at the fact too, of like, if you did the hurdle hop, um, right now, and then you did it again in two minutes, it's not completely the same move, you know, cause there are, their fatigue plays a role yeah, or yeah. maybe your, your joint position might be a little different. But I, I think when you talk about running on rocks, it is like such a significant movement variability that every step is going to be different. So it makes me think that, yeah, you probably are stressing the gel differently, you know, because the mm-hmm. gel has to work to for the compression and the shear and the linear. It's, it's all going to be different if you step on a rock in like supination versus pronation. Um, it's going to be a different, different aspect of the gel working. But then if you start to look at the collagen fascicles, which... For you, as at your age, you probably have collagen fascicles that are are uh, uh, degenerative. Yeah, you, you can know? say that, you can that, say it. Yeah, you can, <laughs> you can bang on me. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're, you're probably gonna, like like I, I'm. I know for a fact if I I when I when I tore my lat tendon, they did an ultrasound on the, on that, and I'm like, I wonder what the the medical route would be for me to just get MRIs or ultrasounds on my patellar tendons. Um, and uh, it might you know I I don't know if I didn't even look into how I could do that, but. 
I pr- I'm pretty sure they would find um like holes in my tendons uh, because I jumped the the amount mm-hmm. of times that I jump and the amount of the of my life that I've jumped. So, anyways, the the idea is. Your tendon is, if I have holes in my tendons, you have holes in your tendons, your tendon still works. You're able to go run and do everything you need to do because it's only probably hurt a few fascicles, but you might have 80% of your fascicles still Mm. available or 95%. And then when you give yourself movement variability, you're probably stressing different Mm. fascicles in different manners. And it's like when you take someone who has the Achilles tendon pain, um, like Achilles tendinopathy, I mean, you have to assume that the entire tendon is not bad. You might just have a few fascicles that are injured. Yeah, yeah. So you that's pr- this probably would go to when someone does some random exercise and they're like, I feel better when I do this thing. It's like, and then you just leave it alone. And you're like, okay, go ahead and do what you want to do. You don't have pain with that. But it doesn't line up with your your physiological understanding. But I think if you advance your, your understanding of physiology and you say that different uh, different movements can stress different fascicles within your tendon, then it would make sense that some things would hurt and some things wouldn't hurt. And giving yourself, um, going and running on rocks is probably giving yourself that variation that you don't get in like day to day life by just walking on a flat surface for your Achilles, you know? Um, so it would make, it would make a lot of sense why the movement variability would be amazing for me. I don't deal with Achilles too much, the patellar Mm -hmm. tendon. Um, I just, I just say spike ball, you know, spike ball's like the spike ball's the best to get movement. Yeah. To get movement variability. Cause if you have jumpers knee and, you're just like a left right jumper or something and it's like your rehab is like do the head the isos and then the lifting and then let's progress back into left right jumping um throw in some spike ball that's probably what you need for your to give your your tendons a little bit of different stress you know um because you're just giving if you just give it those three things give it isos and then heavy strength and then the dunking is like you're giving it three movements and why not give it the thousands that could be involved with uh something random like spike ball or you probably would get it too if you ran on uh, ran on different uh, different um, rocks like the, like you're doing. Yeah. You you would get different stress through your patellar tendon. Um, it wouldn't be the same because like patellar tendon is really like a product of jumping, landing, and changing direction or decelerating. It's really stressed in those areas. So that's why I say spike ball because spike ball involves all of that stuff, and it's so random. Maybe they need a spike ball course that has like different uh, elevations and everything <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah, even the rocks. Um, you know, I was gonna say with my knee, and you're, you're th- that's so fascinating too. By the way, I was just thinking about yeah, if it's like if it's like let's say the the linear pathway, like the pathway. If I was to do a bunch of bound single leg bounding or something, or just go out and do a bunch of tempo sprints, and the fascicles specific to that pathway, my Achilles are an issue, and I go out and run on rocks. Like you know, I I might be hitting that pathway. Maybe it's only one out of three um hits and well the thing with rocks too with the achilles is a lot of the running there is going to be with the ankle relatively locked at 90 that's another huge piece i found is because you're not going to run on rocks and let your heel like fall all the way down (laughs) like you have to kind of keep your ankle locked but then on top of that you get all the the variability and yeah like you said like you get all the different fascicles uh going and and you really distribute it um you know it's interesting too i was thinking about I didn't even know what shin splints were when I was in high school. And then, uh, and I, I played basketball and did track, so variability, and then you go and do track for a little bit. And then when I get to college, like, everyone's like, oh, I have shin splints, oh, my shin hurts. I was like, what the hell is this? Like, you know, I, and, and then it's funny because I, uh, we, my first year, we ran indoors in like a basketball court track. It was like 160 meters. It was just improvised until the school got the indoor track the next year. And I remember after about a couple months of going around that thing, I was like, Man, I am starting to get a little bit of shin issue. Not bad, but I'm like, oh, this is what you guys are talking about. Because it was just the same thing over and over and over and over again. It wasn't, you know, who knows how much the tendon stuff was going on or connective tissue in that compartment. But yeah, it was, it was, it was just like the repetitive. It's like, tell me how many basketball players get shin, you know, issues compared to like runners, like almost none, you know. And so, um, I was gonna say with the rocks, it's interesting. Maybe the thing with my knee is is the the stream I have. Most of the rocks are like you're just running and kind of picking different ones. But sometimes you do actually have elevation changes. Like I do have small up and down elevation changes. And then or you'll jump and do like a precision landing, uh, which in parkour, like a precision landing, you hit with your feet together. And I guess it's like the French style or something of it. But your your knees go out when you land. So like the way that people teach you to squat. But I think it's, it's different because your heels are off the ground. So it actually feels decent. It's kind of like the WEC 45 deadlift feeling. And so I will probably do on any given run, maybe 
maybe I do that, like an elevation change, jump and land, like between three and maybe 15 times. So, you know, you get that thrown in there too, and they're all different. So maybe that helped as well. I don't know. But, but again, watch, watch me talk about all this. And then tomorrow I'm like, you know, doing some exercise. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh. <laughs> so I- yeah, 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 it is. It's, 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 it's like the, those, those anecdotes are fascinating when someone does something like that. And it's like, it makes a lot of sense why it would feel good. And, um, but it does have the opportunity to completely blow up someone's pain as well, you know, <laughs> to make it someone way worse. And it's like, I think there's with, with any tissue, but like specifically tendon is like, you would just have this middle ground of like perfect loading where you're, you're doing, you're maintaining the structure, you're getting the adaptations you want, you're not in pain, but then you push too far to one side, you do too much, you're in bad pain, you get negatives. And then you do go on the other end and you do nothing and you underload and you're damaging the structure and you get negatives. So it's like finding that perfect balance in the middle. Um, and that's one thing that is, I mean, I, I only rehab people's patellar tendons like through my jumpers and protocol mm-hmm. and with consultations online. And that's one of the hardest things to, to teach people is their own intuition, you yeah. know, of like yeah. every day, every day. But, but the benefit is tendons will tell you. So like you have the warm up effect where it, it might be painful at first and then you warm up and you feel better and you get going. And I think a lot of that could just be temperature changes. Mm. And then when you go to bed at night and then you wake up after eight hours, it's like the temperature, it, it's definitely going to be like colder or what you, you don't have that chemical signal of exercise. It's completely gone because you've been laying there for eight hours. So that's where it's the most sensitive. And it's like, you'll know from the day prior, okay, I did too much um, because of that. The, the, the morning thing is, is so obvious, but it's like, that's the, that's the little bit of intuition people would need to put in their tendon rehab which is so simple. It's just like you wake up in the morning, how does your tendon feel? And then it's like, just look at what you did yesterday um, yeah. or two days ago. And then you're like, okay, I did, I did too much or I'm not in any pain and I can t- continue pushing. Um, but it's, it's always like that underloading immobilization thing, unless you ju- unless you need to, or you just coming back from a rupture or something. And that's the recommendation is like, you have to be pulling on your tendon. Like think of that crimp thing I talked about. Mm. If you don't pull on your tendon, it's just crimped. And it's like, the tendon stays crimped and the cells around the collagen, those get fatter and those, and the cells manage everything in your tendon. And it's like your cells are going to work in line with what your collagen is doing. If it's crimped and it's relaxed, your cells get fat and they probably are just like, what do I, what am I doing? Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to produce, I'm not going to tell our body to like lay down more collagen or anything like that. So it's like the loading is so essential for a tendon and it's really just like, just get movement every day. And, uh, that's, that's enough for your tendon to like pull on the tendon. But, um, yeah, the, the Creek thing is the, the, you run on the Creek is, is fascinating. And it's like, people might take it and be like, I need to go do this for my Achilles. And then you have someone who like completely blow, uh, blows up. Their someone, Achilles yeah, pain, you know? yeah. If I took 10 people through that, I've taken people on that run with me before. And I realized that not everyone's parkour <laughs> you know, skills are equal there. Like some people go really well. And then some people are like, you're like 50 yards down, you look back and they've jumped over like eight rocks and so <laughs> and to i've yeah. almost e- eaten it multiple i have fallen in there before so it's like as far as uh you know if i'm a you know I've, let's say i'm a university strength coach with the basketball team it's probably not going to be the best idea to be doing that all the time uh yeah. i did you know i had something interesting a similar i found a similar stimulus was like those little sports science lab discs uh i had uh, gavin mcmillan on it's like a like a black disc like maybe five, six inches um, in diameter. And then it's got a little ball in the bottom and you could do like little uh, ankle circles on it. And I I was doing a workout where I would do like 10 ankle circles each way and then do like a skater squat, 10 ankle circles and a skater squat. And I ended up, I think the particular workout, it was with a deck of cards or something. So whatever the deck said I did. And I I probably had done, by the end of the workout, I probably had done 200 ankle circles and, and I got a similar good feeling in my Achilles the the next day from that. And so, you know, thinking about, yeah, like the different, like, or even the, um, was the Polish jump boxes. Like I'm sure you've probably seen those as like the domey board or the concave board or the, there's all the different shapes. And I think people on the offset would look at those and be like, like, I guess just on a very reductionist standpoint, I think, well, you're training your ankle at different angles, but it's like, well, it's more than that because you're actually, it's almost like you need to give the the tendon, based off what you were saying, to give the uh, the tendon and connective tissue the fullness of the experience, you need a multi-vector loading pattern. You're not going to actually get the fullness of the tendon and connective tissue only through like a, a linear bound or a hurdle hop, let's say. You have to get 
three D in some respect and be able to do yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, that's um that makes me think so like earlier I was saying tendon is dumb and it's like it only responds to muscle or bone. And this is probably why I've laid off the Achilles. I mean, I haven't dealt with Achilles too much. I mm-hmm. had like a reactive one, but I haven't dealt with it enough to care. Probably because I don't run and I don't do things that people get Achilles. I just get the jumpers knee. So it's like mm-hmm. I've been forced to learn about patellar tendon because I've dealt with it like four or five times. But the Achilles, not so much. But anyways, going back to the tendon is dumb is we always think, and I probably put that out too, is like the only way to get adaptation is by pull, the muscle pull. You need to be muscle centric. But I look at the Achilles and it's like, you look at the movement the calcaneus can can have. And it's like doing all those things yeah. like that's those circles you're talking about or doing the, the Polish thing is like, um, I think you're probably affecting the tendon by changing the joint position of the calcaneus, yes, you know? Yes, yeah. You're, yeah. And, and, and then let's go to the patellar and it's like, how do you affect, how do you affect the bones? Of the, not really. It's like, I guess we talk about when, when you get patellar tendon pain, your knee locks up, you don't want to bend it. So that would probably correlate with like tibial. You don't have tibial internal rotation, right? Your tibia doesn't want to internally rotate because it's locked up in that top position. So that would probably be the only bone motion there is like the patellar, like, cause the kneecap, if the kneecap is moving around excessively, you're probably going to get patellofemoral pain. You're not going to get patellar tendon pain. Um, and when you do develop patellar tendon pain, it's like, if we looked at the, that getting the stress through the bones is like, I do, I think you got to go to the quads. I think it's, mm-hmm. it has to be all about the quads, but when you get to the, the Achilles, it's almost like, it's not too much about the calf muscles. Cause like talking with David Gray is like, you can do all the calf raises in the world to make that thing strong and people still have bad Achilles pain. So I'm like, I wonder, and this is just what I thought right now, and I'm probably going to mm-hmm. disagree with it in like 10 <laughs> minutes, but I'm like, I wonder if the Achilles is more about what's happening at the calcaneus I and if the so. patellar about more what's happening at the quad muscle, you know? Yes. Um, uh, yeah. Calcaneus yeah. is absolutely huge with the Achilles, 100%. Yeah. Um, oh, what was I going to say? Oh, you were mentioning the knee. I was just thinking about the sports science lab disc. So I, I, Outside of the creek running, the one change too, I, I just mentioned those, the discs. And I had, for about two years or maybe more, I've had these huge, like, so this all came out of the Marinovich training system. And I think Edith Hoist was a big pioneer in this as well. But like, I mentioned like the disc that's like five or six inches in diameter. The original Marinovich discs were like 12. They're huge. You put your whole foot on them. You got bought them through Jump USA or something. And, and I found that a lot of people couldn't stand on those. They just fall over. Someone even broke them at the gym because he couldn't stand on it. And they were having a competition, just like it broke. And so the sports science lab ones are cool because they're metal. They're not going to break. And I found they're lower to the ground. And I was doing like a lot of skater squats with them. Um, and the thing that Marvin said this, it's like when you have like a little 3D, a little play in the foot, you can do like different lines of, you know, your leg can do different lines of movement. And so... I kind of wonder, like, in the scope of those skater squats, you're not locked in um, by the foot flat on the ground. When the foot's flat on the ground, it locks you in a little bit. And you, you could pressure your heel more. You can pressure the ball of your foot more, and you'll get weird or different play in how your knees go in or out and squatting. But I kind of wonder um, how that might have helped me as well. Because I always felt my knee never really hurt so much, uh, especially the right one. I never had the problems with it when my foot could glide on that disc and, and move however it wanted to versus being on something a little bit more solid and then playing with that enough in different ways i think might have been helpful too so but it, it's different right because like when your knee bends you have the tibia and fibula that rotate a little bit like there's some rotation right but it's not as much as um, other joints in the body yeah 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 it's um yeah I, well, i'd be curious why your your knee feel feel better and it's it's like so i talked to enda king i don't know if you ever talked to enda king i think he's out in ireland i did a patel tendon podcast and it was like this guy is like simplifies things so mm. well. Um, one of the most enjoyable talks I've had, but yeah, he was talking about, cause people talk about knee pain and like, well, what role does the ankle or the Achilles have? And it's just like that whole idea of like, well, if that, if that area can't um, manage the forces, it just goes up the kinetic chain mm-hmm. to the knee. And it's like as simple as, you know, like um, maybe it's over simple, uh, simplistic. I don't know, but it's like, man, that makes a lot of sense. You know, if your Achilles, if your calcaneus, your Achilles is locked up, your calf can't do what it needs to do. Um, and then you have the, the patellar tendon is already a stiff knee thing. It's like, you just have more locked up, locked upness in your, in your lower <laughs> leg. And it's like, everything just is locked up. And it's like, now that force to go into your knee. So I'm like, uh, I do think that, yeah, when you get knee patellar tendon or patellofemoral pain is like, just having a good calcaneus that can move around or having a good Achilles that mm-hmm. works is like, that is so huge for that. It's why like 
people with with both of those i say the quad is very important but it's like if you're if your lower leg sucks you're just going to keep coming back to the patellar tendinopathy so um there needs to be a focus on like whatever you want to do some progression of making sure that you can you can store and release with that achilles um good it's like it's so crucial to, to patellar tendon pain and probably probably patellofemoral as well. But it's like the knee issue. Yes, the quads are huge. At least when, when we were talking about that thing of like the quads are probably more important than the t- having the tibia to rotate or whatever. But the, the whole different bucket is like you need to make sure that your lower leg works well um, in order to spare your your knees. So for you, it's probably like that's probably why I, that's what I would think is like you're getting all this variability and movement with your ankle, with your calcaneus, with the lower leg. That's probably going to be amazing for your for your um, knee pain. Yeah. Um, back to what you were saying with the like the quad and maybe just like collagen and the uh, the matrix. The uh, I, I forgot it again. I keep, I keep, yeah, just I, IFM. I just call I, it IFM. Yeah. Because if you said if you said there's interfascicular, which means like outside of the fascicles, and there's also intrafascicular matrix. Uh, and I actually one of the first posts I did on Instagram, I actually wrote intrafascicular, and I had to delete it and go back and change it because <laughs> it was completely wrong because inside the fascicles you do not have the gel you have collagen and the collagen is like there's proteoglycans and there's cells and everything but it's like it is not and and it could be wrong but it's kind of like a dry component it's like very dry within the fascicles and then outside the fascicles is that gel like fluid like component Mm. um that's the way i look at it i could be kind of off on that but it's it helps my understanding the fascicles are dry and then the outside is the wet um like fluid type thing but anyways i just thought say ifm that's Simplest way, IFM gel. Yeah, I definitely need to do that. I know yeah. <laughs> for me, I need analogies to help me. I know even with like intra and intermuscular coordination, when I've talked about that, I remember I was teaching a class at Wilmington College where I'm talking about that. And I'm like, it takes me when those two are so interchangeable, the intra and intra, I have to like triple check myself because I'm like, I'm going to mess this up for yeah, sure. Yeah, I yeah. totally get the yeah, IFM. I'm good with IFM. Yeah. Uh, so with in terms of like, let's just say, I think you would say maybe I'm in a standard like strength training, athletic performance, fitness situation where um, maybe it's not rehab per se, but like, uh, let's just say my question is like, like normal athletes are healthy. No one's coming off a tendon uh, issue or injury. And we talked about like the heavy lifting and the collagen versus more plyometric. Maybe we could say plyometrics of variability for the IFM Uh, and like ratios of doing that. You had also said too, like if you're hurt, like you're hurt, hurt you're probably only going to really be able to do the heavy stuff because the 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 plyos or anything else would be too much. And so you have to only do the one. Um, but then there's also that, well, if you do too much heavy stuff for too long, right? And we like have that ratio of like elasticity yeah. and things. So maybe just thoughts like, hey, you're just training somebody, you're ta- training a group and we're taught. And I think it's just human nature. To, Let's do freaking everything. Let's do all the heavy ISOs and we'll do all this and all this and all this. And then I feel like at some time it just becomes a little bit robotic too. It's like, and, and the art is to, to do less, you know, like to, all right, we need this at this time and let's roll with this, but I'm, I'm getting, I'm talking too much here. Anyways, just thoughts yeah, on yeah. thoughts on how you would just approach, let's just say a typical, a typical training season in light of the ratio of like heavy ISOs, ISOs, um, more elastic plyo type stuff in light of tendon health and performance. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we talked before. I don't know if you recorded that, but like the the Nassim Taleb interventionalista type, and I'm like, I mean, both of us are probably the opposite of that, where it's like only intervening when there's a problem. Um, so if if there's not a problem, it's like just keep doing things that just keep doing it the way we've always done it. Mm-hmm. You know, like it, it's been working. And uh, but anyways, so yeah, if someone has the tendon pain, it's like or patellar tendon specifically, it's like, okay, get on good rehab, like scrap everything else. Let's let's take care of this patellar tendon pain, uh, get it under control. But yeah, if you have a team that's like, it would be like a basketball team or something where you'd be concerned with Achilles health and patellar tendon health. Um, and everyone's healthy, it would just be like, just do smart training. That's, that's all it is. And, and if you look at, um, so if you want to talk about collagen synthesis of like, you put, uh, you want, um, collagen within your tendons um and the collagen goes in your tendons the collagen synthesis gets bumped up from any exercise so you could go play basketball you're gonna get collagen synthesis you could go lift weights you get collagen synthesis you go do Mm -hmm. laundry you get a little bit of collagen you know you get collagen synthesis from anything it's that you have a rate of collagen synthesis and collagen degradation and when you do like a crazy workout like say you're gonna go play basketball for three hours 
that's probably where you get more degradation mm -hmm. than synthesis. So you'd need a few days of rest. So that's, again, this is just common sense. If you went and practiced for one hour a day, you could probably practice for seven days a week and be fine. And then add in a little bit of lifting. Um, I would, I would be, I would be lifting anyone pretty much always, you know, because it's like, we know that, that, that muscle strength is so key for tendon health. Um, it's, it's difficult for me with the Achilles still, you know, cause I'm like, yeah. you don't see the muscle wasting with the Achilles. And then it's like, go do a heavy calf raise, like seated standing calf raise. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I, when I train teams for the time I did, we never did calf raises. We never, you know, um, and it's also young kids, college athletes. You're not going to have the same rates of Achilles rupture or Achilles tendinopathy than like an older group would have. Um, uh, but it's like, we just don't do those, those calf raises. And I think you just kind of figure it out that your, your ankle and your Achilles and your calf complex, it gets developed by doing like plyos or mm -hmm. doing sprints or doing, doing a bunch of foot contacts. And then when it comes to like quad strength, um, yeah, you get quad strength from like jumping, landing, cutting, stuff like that. But those things are so easy to overdo, especially as a basketball player. You overdo those things and your knee starts bugging you. You get patellar tendon or patellofemoral and you kind of just see your quad shut off. Like your quad just, just minimizes in size. So that's why I think just keeping lifting in year round is like you'll, you'll probably tolerate lifting very well, even if you have the patellar tendon pain. Um, patellofemoral gets a little bit touchy because it hurts anytime you bend your knee. Just kind of a dull, annoying pain. But lifting is a way, a lifting is a way to just keep your quads strong. Like for sure, your quads are going to stay strong because you're lifting, doing like split squats or leg extensions or something. Um, and then, and then sure, strengthen your hips, your hamstrings, all that stuff. But I, uh, yeah, if people are healthy. It's like, let's just do normal training and use common sense about, about what's going on. And it's, it's like you said, tendon health and tendon performance. And I would going back to tendon is dumb. The tendon gets health and performance just by proxy of you doing smart training. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't need you don't need to do the heavy ISOs for someone who's completely healthy. You do not need to do heavy leg extension ISOs for someone who's completely healthy to develop their patellar tendon. They develop their patellar tendon by playing sport and probably from like lifting some weights every once in a while. But um, yeah, this this whole thing of like let's do it for preventative measures, do heavy ISOs for preventive. I'm I'm really against that. I I don't think you need to be doing that um just just do good training good normal training there's no need to intervene and change things uh you do that when things blow up and our our ability to to predict who's going to blow up or when it's going to blow up we don't have that at all so it's basically just run things the way you best know and then if you need to step in later because something happened then you step in but the whole prediction thing trying to prevent tendon issues i just just use common sense and that's probably the best thing you can do it's it's refreshing to hear that too, because I think so often it's like almost incentivizing to have this cool little niche answer on on these things. That it was I'll always remember this uh, Angus Ross in the first or second podcast, a uh, sports scientist and sports performance coach from New Zealand was talking about. It's kind of like when I think Franz Bosch idea and a Franz Bosch idea is proliferating. Like, oh, if you deep squat, there's too much muscle slack and something isn't going to work right and. Angus was like, I don't think the body's that dumb. <laughs> like <it's, laughs> and and it is just like all this, so much of this stuff, like the answer is being found in nature, right? It's built in the system. If you do good training, the whole body will adapt in the way the body is supposed to uh, adapt unless, you know, we get something goes wrong and you're hurt and now you need to do something, look at a different set of rules or things like that. Um, so, you know, just that in mind, I mean, I guess, you know, just that being said, I mean, you get you get what you train for, right? So, if we're looking at, you know, I, I just, I do think in, it is interesting because we talk about, you know, tendon training and adaptation. And maybe this was a piece for me is I guess you think, well, can, how do we make our, our get, have super tendons, right? It, like, it come like these like kangaroo people. Not that we, we can't be kangaroos though because we're not built like kangaroos. I actually went to the zoo and I was having a conversation with the, the zookeeper about, I was just watching the kangaroos and they were saying how like their hips are fused together to actually give them more pressure and stability in the jumping motion. Humans don't have that. Our hips don't wow. do that. And it's like, it'd be kind of cool to be in a kangaroo's body and just feel what it's like to just, you know, basically be able to ride that jump. You don't have to create the effort, right? It's cool <laughs> to think. But um, you know, I, I used to be at a place where I used to think more kind of like there was a super training you could do just for the tendons. But like, kind of like you were saying, like you, if you train smart, like the tendons will adapt. You lift weights you know, the tendons adapt, but you also said too, being strong can spare the tendons as well. But it was uh, Christian Thibodeau had talked about, it was like a Canadian uh, strong man who could do all these incredible feats. I think he like climbed like a telephone pole with the, the, the there was like a little pegs to climb. He dragged like a horse up there or something. I don't know what the hell he did, but 
they said his tendons were like X amount, like two or two and a half times bigger than everyone else's or stronger or whatever. And it's like, it wasn't plyometric training. It was just human level stuff, you know, being a strong human being. Um, I'm sure like Stefan Holm, high jumper, his Achilles was like four times the deformation. It just seems like if you have high forces, the, the tendons have to adapt. There's nothing. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of situations where you could end up with really strong muscles and like really wussy tendons i guess right like yeah i think i think um i think it's just slower like the thing with the muscle like you can make someone bigger and anyone who's trying to get bigger they they cannot get big fast enough you know or Mm -hmm. like it's it's so hard to get big and it's like it's not really like gaining muscle size or gaining muscle strength happens relatively quickly if you compare it to what's happening at a tendon because Mm -hmm. tendon is like crazy slow it it does if you have a strong muscle the tendon is going to be stronger guaranteed but it's just going to be like a delayed thing. Leg, it's not going to uh, happen to me. Yeah. So that's, that could be, hmm. I don't want to get into that with like, the, I guess the bodybuilder, they rupture their tendons more often. And people say it's because yeah. their muscle got too big yeah. and their tendon was weaker. And it's like, well, there's also problems with taking uh, anabolic steroids is bad <laughs> yeah. for the collagen. And then mm-hmm. it causes weird things with the tendon crimp. Um, so just some bad, th- but anyways, go back to, um, you talking about this guy who had like twice as big of tendons or whatever. And they did a study on badminton players and, um, badminton and fencers and the lead leg because they have a lead leg like the right leg is the lead leg um it was like 1.25 times bigger than mm. their back leg and and 1.25 times because it's bigger it's also stiffer yeah. 1.25 times stiffer and stronger so i think the way to develop um if you wanted like a super tendon the way to develop that would be start when you're first are able to move and whatever your activity like i guess you don't want to specialize too early but it's like you need to load for your whole life. And that's yeah. how you're going to build the bit, the tendon bigger um, and stronger and stiffer. Um, and then you look at, so there's, there's work by Michael Kerr and uh, yeah, I think it's mainly Michael Kerr. No. Um, yeah. Michael Kerr, uh, Katya Hennemeyer about the, you build your tendon until you're skeletally mature and then it's basically yeah. done. Yeah. So it's like, just like most tissues of your body. But the thing is when you're skeletally mature, people still get huge muscles. Uh, people can still get way bigger in their muscles. Um, it's that I, I don't think your bones change too much. Your tendons will change. They're kind of that middle guy, but they just take way longer to change. And it's like you look at the people who have the mass. It, there's a genetic influence guaranteed. There's there's definitely you're you're born you're born with you're cut from a different cloth when you're born in mm-hmm. terms of like your g- genes and your tendons. But there is ways to change, and I think those changes just take years. They would take so long of you doing the activity you want to do, but then not doing it too much and not over specializing. You know, all those, all mm-hmm. those, like, uh, all the Chinese finger traps that go into uh, increasing performance. Uh, but yeah, it's going to take a long time. It would take a very long time. And you're not going to get these super tendons by doing uh, heavy ISOs for two yeah, months. Yeah. It's like the person who has the super tendons, if you were cut from the same cloth, they would have the super tendon because they've been playing basketball like daily for the last 20 years and you just picked it up yesterday like you've already lost uh you're not gonna have you're not gonna have the tendon like that person who's been doing it their whole life yeah it's it's maybe like um i love that you just said patience like that's something like dan john talks about a lot it's like the workout's easy the hard part is doing it consistently for eight years and it just makes sense too it's like you get what you train for like if you want to be a good jumper you play a lot of basketball or do you know, like different plyometrics and things like that. And you do it consistently for a long period of time and the body is smart and it'll just adapt as per the demands of what you're looking for. And so it, even the guy who like had to walk on his toes, like had the bone spurs, it's like long period of time, muscles got strong, like calf and foot and all that stuff probably got really strong too. It just because consistency just over time, over time, over time. And so that's where I, you know, one of my own cur- kind of curiosities is a would be to do I do like I run in the creek like twice a week I'm like what if I ran for like an hour four times a week I don't know I'm just kind of curious like that consistency over time too and like bumping that up or something like that and so the I don't I mean I don't know if you're running this issue because we're not the same people but I'm like I I just I get so bored so fast (laughs) you know so like if ever I'm like I'm gonna do this for this this adaptation it's like I'm going to be tired. Like I used to do daily, daily ISO lunge, you know, for a while, like when COVID hit and oh, yeah. um, I haven't done ISO lunge in so long. It's like, I just got bored of it. I'm done with it, you know, but for a while there, I did it every day for like three months, four months. Uh, but things, things, it's like when you, when you, it's almost like, I, I love just surrendering to whatever your nature is. And I'm like, 
why did I get my vertical to like nearly 40 and dunking though? It was like, I just wanted to dunk every day as much mm-hmm. as possible. Like I didn't have to, I didn't have to step back and be like, look at my training plan and say, okay, I'll dunk on Saturday. And then on a Tuesday or a Wednesday, it's like, I just found a group of people who wanted to dunk. And it's like, we dunked as often as our patellar tendons could handle. Um, and that's how we mm-hmm. developed it, you know? And I'm like, I think that's how they, just look at kids. That's how kids develop their tendons is like play. They do a bunch of oh, play, yeah. but then the weird thing is when you get older and you become hyper aware, it's like you artificially try to create play. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I wonder if it works the same, you know, I don't think it, it would, it, it couldn't work the same. I and think I think, so. yeah, that, that could be a reason why when you get older and your brain develops more and you maybe get bored of certain things, it's like, of course, you're going to lose your elasticity with your tendons because you're not playing for eight hours like you did when you were a kid because it, it's just not fun anymore. Yeah. You know? <laughs> there, I, heard, I heard the term like flow versus force. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot just in any training session. And I think it, it always comes up too, right? It's like even in dunking, it's like, oh, I can't quite get this dunk and I'm going to just try hard. And sometimes you do. But at the end of the day, like when you're a kid, everything is flow. Like it's like you are more elastic by nature. Your tissues are more hydrated and it's all like everything is fun. You don't do anything that's not fun unless there's a parent making you do it, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I I watch my kids do stuff that they find fun and they could literally like, like, I did not tell them to do this. My daughter is like, she, she's like, Hey dad, come, come watch this. And and it's funny because my, my, um, my daughter is not like a super athlete. She picks flowers in soccer practice. She's seven. Like she's not like, but she like jumped off the front porch down two steps, like bounded over a a asphalt slab, bounded to a rock and jumped on the grass and thought it was great. And I was like, I don't think you've seen me doing this, but that's cool that you like it. You know, it's like, they'll just find that stuff. It's fun to them. It's not training to them. And they're doing, uh, they're doing a lot of it barefoot. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's like, it's kind of, there's a mentality, I think that kind of fits with anything, you know, that, that, that complements it and makes it a little bit better. So it's been fun to watch that and seeing what they like to do. Um, you, dude, I think it's the same with the horses, the horse tendinopathy, because you take, um, and the whole development thing, um, but they, they did that once they did one study where like one group was stuck in a stall when they're it was like one to five months old stuck in a stall one group was stuck in a stall but they exercised them like five days a week and then one group was just let out in a pasture all day they could do whatever they wanted and at the end of five months uh they euthanized all of them people i posted this on instagram people had an issue like how cruel <laughs> whatever that's the way science is but anyways the ones who were in the pasture their tendons were like two times bigger, mm-hmm. almost two times bigger than the people, the the horses that were stuck in the stall or the horses who were stuck in the stall and, and exercise for like one hour a day, whatever it was. Hmm. But it's like the crucial time for tendon development is when you're, when you're growing and when you're growing, you usually just play all the time. Yeah. And if you look at the nature of your tendon, like right now for us, our tendons have very few cells. It's basically, it's mostly, it's mostly all collagen because it needs to be strong. But when you're born, it's mostly all cells and barely any collagen. And then as you load it over the lifetime, your cells go, your cells kind of realize we need to protect ourselves because they're, Mm. the cells are capable. They have like actinomyosin, so they're capable of contracting. But think of how if your, if your tendon was just all cells, it would be so weak. It would, it would just rupture all, it'd be like a muscle. It would rupture all the time. So the cells start to lay down collagen as you get older and older. And probably by the time you're like zero to 17, your the the cells have depleted and the collagen has raised and it's like you only get that signal by loading by exercise you yeah. know um so when you're a young horse or a young child it's like they're supposed to exercise all day because their tendons need the signal to lay down more collagen so that later in life they they can have a tendon that's resilient so anyways go back to like why we have tendon issues and stuff like that i wonder how much of that in the future could be traced back to uh, if you had a childhood of like less activity Mm. and maybe you'd see that now if kids are just playing a bunch of video games yeah maybe in 50 years we see everyone rupturing their Achilles (laughs) I mean who knows (laughs) who knows Uh, yeah I don't know it is I I will say that yeah like those two things the two of the things you said I just think are so critical like one just be looking that childhood window of training like it might even been the podcast you um and I and Austin Yoakum were on together where Jeremy just kept talking about He's like, my goal is to be able to get a hold of these kids earlier to train and to get them to move and to get them to be able to expose the right movement environment earlier. Because if it was too late, I just couldn't do as much for them. And so I think that's just huge is like, yeah, you talked about like the horse and it's like play in the pasture and you wonder, yeah, like even with the, like the tendon almost after you're 18, there's only so much you can do for the the structure of the tendon anymore in terms of before. 
And so um, I feel like the other thing I was going to say is something to do with play, like the emotion almost of being in the pasture, right? Like just the, the, the enjoyment of it. I know I, this is an end of one who knows how much like <laughs> more there is to this, but I found like along with the running in the Creek, I went to the Rafe Kelly's return to the source retreat um, like two years ago now. And, and it was a lot of this, like it, we, we did like some like Creek type running, a lot of running and jumping off of rocks, a lot of tag in the woods like jumping over logs or like just all sorts of stuff, jumping on trees. And I had barefoot shoes on. And I remember when I got back from that, I tested my jump um, on the jump mat or RSI. And my, just like the the pop I had was like almost nothing I've had. Like the output I was getting from the calf up was almost like nothing I'd gotten before. I I don't think my hips and my legs and my knees were strong enough to really maximize and take advantage of it. But it was just really interesting. Like it was almost like play and diversity coupled with, and just community there uh, with that. And then it'd be interesting to see whatever happened to my feet, calves, Achilles afterwards. But it was really interesting. I always remember the way my feet felt after doing that and the the spring and the connectivity I got out of it. So, you know, maybe that's something to do with the pasture. Pasture example made me think about that. Yeah. You you had pasture raised. Your tendons were pasture, pasture raised. <laughs> pasture raised, grass fed. Pasture raised, grass fed tendons. All right, on. Well, anything, uh, any anything you want to say before we get out of here? Any like thing you're working on or um, any? I am working on. I am working on the tendon thing. I don't know what it's going to be yet because I wrote my jumper's knee protocol like a science section. So I'm I'm working on that. I think I'm just going to do a. The thing with doing whole all the tendons is all the tendons are so different. Like the patella and the Achilles, we talk about how different they are. Like we talked a little bit today about the differences, but those things are so similar compared to other, like the wrist tendons and the elbow tendons and the rotator cuff uh, is like those, ten- all these tendons are so different. So I think I'm going to come out with a product maybe on all the tendons and just this understanding of um, how they're built, the cells, the circadian rhythm, all these different concepts with tendons that I've learned. And then I'll probably make a course specifically for the patella. Um, and maybe one for the Achilles, but uh, I, I don't know. I kind of leave Achilles alone. I leave Achilles for David Gray and like Matt Watson. And I'm like, if you want Achilles problems, just go to those guys. Because uh, I don't, I'm not passionate. I've never really had Achilles problems. So uh, I am on the patellar. So yeah, those are the things I'm kind of working on. And um, uh, as you said earlier, you had a thing you were going to get done in one month. And then it ended up taking seven months. <laughs> so if I, if I tell you it's going to be done in one month, it'll probably be done in like three years. Yeah, so, happens. Lo- we're on the same page with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Love it. Hey, well, thanks so much for being on the show, Jake. It was great catching up with you again here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. Appreciate you being here, and we'll see you all next week.